With the launch of Yuri Gagarin on Vostok 1, the Soviets thrust the world into the space age, and they hit another first with the first manned docking and transfer of crew during the Soyuz 4 and 5 missions. This, in the words of Soviet TV, was the world's first experimental cosmic station with four compartments for the crew. One rather large issue in this style of station was that it lacked a dedicated airlock for crew transfer. This means that to switch from one capsule to another, the cosmonauts had to undergo a brief spacewalk. Two crew left Soyuz 5, Yevgeny Krunov and Alexei Yeliseyev, to join Vladimir Shatilov in Soyuz 4. This left Boris Volnyov with the task of deorbiting Soyuz 5. After the deorbit burn was completed, Volnyov went through the routine task of detaching the equipment module. But despite firing the explosive bolts that held the two parts of the spacecraft together, the equipment module failed to detach. This led to the heat shield not being exposed, and after a short time, the capsule was burning up in the atmosphere, with Volnyov inside scribbling notes for the engineers in the smoke-filled cabin while facing almost certain death. But at the last moment, the equipment module detached from the descent stage, and the capsule righted itself. And when the heat shield was finally put in between Volnyov and the 2,000-degree plasma stream, imminent disaster was averted. But this respite was brief. Disaster struck again when the parachutes only partially deployed and the soft landing retro rockets, which allow the Soyuz to touch down on land, you guessed it, softly. This hard landing robbed our brave cosmonaut of many of his teeth, but miraculously, he survived. Two years after the docking of the Soyuz's 4 and 5, the Soviets launched the first permanent space station. Named Salyut 1, the, the station had four compartments a main habitation module 4 meters in diameter, a transfer compartment equipped with the only docking port, often docked with the crew transfer vehicle. A modified service module was used for the propulsion, and the auxiliary module contained all of the control, power, and life support units for the station. Soyuz 10 was the first mission assigned to dock with the new Salyut station, piloted by the intrepid Shadilov, who due to his experience in docking was chosen for the mission. After a string of missed rendezvous, the crew of Soyuz 10 managed to manually soft dock with Salyut. But, when Shatilov learned that the Soyuz was not actually connected to the station, and repeated attempts at achieving a hard dock failed, he was ordered to pull away from the station for one last attempt. But the Soyuz didn't move, it was stuck. Mission Control quickly went over all the options to extract the Soyuz. The options were transferring the crew to the descent module and jettisoning the orbital module. This would leave the orbital module attached to the station. And since Salyut only had one docking port, this method would render the first station in space inoperable. They could also use an emergency undocking procedure, where explosive bolts separate the docking probe from the rest of the active docking mechanism. This would destroy the docking port and render the station inoperable again. Faced with two bad choices and a dwindling oxygen supply, Shadilov tried to pull away from the station again, and miraculously, it came unstuck without a hitch. After this unsuccessful mission, the Soyuz 11 mission was readied for launch. The mission had an uneventful docking and habitation of the station, setting an endurance record for their mission. But on re-entry, the Soviet string of bad luck continued. The explosive bolts that connect the service and descent modules fired all at once instead of sequentially. The shock caused a pressure equalization valve to be knocked open. This killed the crew within a minute. This tragedy, which killed cosmonauts Georgi Dubrovsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsev, also ended the story of Salyut 1. The resulting investigation meant that Soyuz was grounded long enough for the station to run out of fuel. This led flight control to deorbit the station, and so ended the unfortunate and short story of man's first space station. The next three space stations launched by the Soviets were all failures. The first failure was DOS-2, a civilian station that was meant to replace Salyut-1. It fell into the Pacific after issues with its second stage. The next failure was the Salyut-2, a secret military station meant for manned reconnaissance under the ALMAS program. It lost attitude control and depressurized, meaning no crew missions were attempted. DOS-3 was the third failure, which burned up in the atmosphere due to a faulty guidance computer. It must have been absolutely demoralizing to be involved in Soviet spaceflight at this point. They had been beaten to the moon, 
and their own N1 rocket was facing failure after failure. And even after Brezhnev made a public commitment to space stations as the future for the Soviet space industry, the next operational station would be launched a full year after Skylab. This next station was the first operational Almaz station, but it was launched under the pretext of being a civilian Salyut station. Its main purpose was as a manned Earth observation laboratory, with the Agat-1 telescope being capable of resolutions approaching one meter. Cosmonauts on the station had the ability to develop film and broadcast the images down to Earth. Probably the most unique feature of Salyut 3 was its armament. That's right, armament. The Soviets wanted their precious military station defended by a cannon. The R-23M, originally meant to be mounted on aircraft, was put on Alma station. Due to the repeated failures of the IGLA docking system, the Soyuz was grounded for four months, and in the meantime, Salyut 3 was to be deorbited. But the station would not go quietly. Its onboard cannon was ordered to fire 20 shells in total, with the attitude control thrusters used to stabilize the craft's orientation. This was the first and only firing of a gun in space. Salyut 3 re-entered shortly after this test on the 24th of January 1975. Salyut 4, a civilian station, and Salyut 5, an Almaz, were both pretty unremarkable, surprising considering the exploits of previous stations, with the only notable points being the addition of an extra main solar panel and incremental design changes to Salyut 4, while Salyut 5 hosted two crews that engaged in Earth observation. And the first mission to it, Soyuz 21, was cut short due to a nitric acid fuel leak. Both were deorbited in 1977. The Salyut 6 station was a step forward for space stations, however. It was able to be refueled by a visiting Progress spacecraft while a Soyuz was docked. The two docking ports, combined with the Soviets finally working out the kinks in the Soyuz, meant that Salyut 6 was able to stay in orbit for four years. During this time, the station was crewed by 33 separate cosmonauts from various different countries. This was thanks to the Intercosmos program, which allowed Salyut 6 to host astronauts from the GDR, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Cuba, Mongolia, and Vietnam, making spaceflight available to citizens of non-superpowers. Surprisingly, France and England also participated in the program, despite being NATO members. And England also participated in the program, despite being NATO members. The TKS spacecraft was also autonomously docked with the station after it was slated to deorbit, to prove that modules could be added autonomously to space stations. This was a huge paradigm shift and paved the way for the dawn of modular space stations like the Mir and ISS. Salyut 7 was launched in the spring of 1982. It immediately replaced the Salyut 6 and was crewed a couple of weeks after launch by the crew of Soyuz Mission T5. The station was the most advanced and comfortable one yet, boasting a refrigerator, an upgraded exercise station, and 20 porthole windows. Everything wasn't picture perfect, however. During the stay of Vladimir Lachov and Alexander Alexandrov, three leaks broke out in one of the fuel tanks, and four EVAs and two specific resupply missions were needed to fix it. Two years later, February 1985, ground control lost contact with Salyut 7 after a loss of power during one of its uninhabited phases. The Soyuz T-13 mission with Vladimir Janibankov and Viktor Savink were sent to re-establish contact with the station, which they found slowly tumbling around its long axis. After docking and realizing the electrical system of the station was out, the crew tested the atmosphere and noticed it was cold but breathable. After donning winter gear, Janibankov and Savink diagnosed the problem as an issue with the solar array pointing system. After using the dock Soyuz to reorient the station, the battery slowly charged and systems came online one by one, with attitude control coming online on June 13th. By the end of July, humidity had returned to normal, and one of the long-lasting effects of the shutdown was the destruction of the water heating system through freezing effects. Salyut 7 saw two more crews visited after its rehabilitation, and when the final so Soyuz T-15 crew left, it was boosted into a higher orbit where it was meant to stay until 1994, when a Buran flight was meant to retrieve it. Sadly, enhanced solar activity meant that the Salyut station's orbit decayed until it re-entered over Argentina in 1991. This put an end to the Salyut series of space stations, a little-known but incredibly influential program 
that continues to shape human spaceflight today, over three decades later. This video leaned heavily on both David S. F. Portree's NASA report on the Mir Hardware Heritage and David Shaler and Rex Hall's book, Soyuz, A Universal Spacecraft. I can't recommend either enough, and links to take a look at both of them are in the description. Thank you, and I hope to see you next time.